<laughs> that does not taste great. There's definitely something off about it. So let's talk about off flavors. So, as the cold opener suggests, uh, this beer is not fantastic. So this is the one of the ones we made off camera. I was playing around with the Nipa recipe, but I made a colossal mistake somewhere in this process, and that kind of got me to thinking, probably a good time to start chatting about off flavors, because we haven't discussed it yet, and it is really one of the things that turns like a great recipe into a terrible batch, and uh, if you can't figure out why it's happening, every beer after that is gonna taste just as bad. So. Let's get into it and talk about the six most common off flavors in the world of home brewing. Off flavor number one, acid aldehyde. So this is a compound that's formed to, you know, from a couple of different sources. Firstly, what does it taste and smell like? It's mostly kind of like, um, you know, like fresh paint, kind of a, uh, a green, not quite ripe apple or like a fresh cut pumpkin. Like that kind of smell you get when you're chopping open a pumpkin and you're about to cook a roast dinner or something. That that's sort of what this kind of chemical tastes and smells like. So it's it's about unripe fruit basically and kind of vegetal flavors that you don't really want and they kind of taste a bit artificial, a bit, a bit like um that kind of thing on your tongue. Anyway, that's I think actually what is wrong with this particular beer here amongst one other problem as well. So this is basically caused uh, when yeast is under stress. So one of the big things that can cause this is when you under pitch the amount of yeast. If you don't put enough yeast in, it's gonna stress them out because during that logarithmic phase, yeast is desperately trying to reproduce fast enough to fill out the volume of the vessel that it's in. So when you don't pitch enough yeast, that fermentation process is under a lot of stress in the beginning and it starts to produce copious amounts of acid aldehyde which leads to those gross off flavors. Uh, another thing that could be done with this is when you pitch your yeast into a really warm wort and then you very quickly cool it down afterwards. So yes, it's good to pitch yeast with wort that's slightly warmer, not drastically warmer and then immediately cooling it down throughout the uh, fermentation process. You want that fermentation temperature to stay stable. When it's cooling down throughout the process, it helps to produce more acid aldehyde. Um, last thing is uh, a little bit of an odd one, but basically under or over aerating your wort. So when there's too much oxygen going on in there, or when there's too little oxygen in your wort, it's gonna stress out that yeast. So you really want it at that happy Goldilocks zone. If you're using something like a, uh, a paint mixer and you're giving it a mix inside the fermenter before you pitch your yeast, Generally, a good rule of thumb is do it for one minute, no more, no less. And that's gonna help you make your yeast nice and healthy. Off flavor, number two, alcoholic. This one seems counterintuitive, but basically we're not talking about alcohol being in the beer. Obviously we want that. We're talking about the obvious presence of that hot prickly kind of alcohol. So the best way that you can kind of know that this one is there is it kind of gives you that taste of that hot prickly sensation of like a cheap tequila. It's got that artificial, gross, really cheap vodka, cheap tequila kind of taste to it. And it's not really something you want. It gives you that hot prickly feeling on your tongue and the back of your mouth. It's just, it's not warranted, you don't want it. It's not improving the experience of your beer drinking. Now, there's a couple different ways that this one is caused, but firstly, the reason that this thing tastes alcoholic is because it's higher weight fusel alcohols. So during that fermentation process, the yeast has been stressed out and it's pushed it towards making fusel alcohols, literally like the kind of stuff that goes into petrol. You don't want that in your beer, you want straight ethanol. So those fusel alcohols are caused mostly by two reasons. One, the yeast is way too stressed out from being way too warm. So if you've got a really hot fermentation going on, typically above 80 de uh, 27 degrees Celsius or 80 degrees Fahrenheit, I did one for the Americans out there, that's gonna help push it towards, you know, making those fusel alcohols and it's just gonna ruin your entire batch. Um, that's not to say though, that there aren't beers that can't ferment hot. If it's a specific yeast that can do it, like a, a Kavaiak yeast, for example, that one actually is meant to ferment hot. But when it's a normal, like a, a normal baker's yeast, brewer's yeast, don't push it too hot. It's gonna make fusel alcohols. Second big reason is high gravity works. So there's a couple different ways that this happens, but it's typically common with something like a, you know, a double dry hopped IPA where you're pushing like 8% and above you do start running into that risk of stressing out the yeast to the point where it creates that hot prickly alcoholic sensation. So 
To help prevent that, make your yeast as comfortable and as healthy as possible. So do a starter culture. Uh, don't you know stress out your yeast by just whacking it from the packet straight into a really high gravity word. Make sure that it eases into the process and they don't get freaked out. Another thing is if you are like an extract brewer and you're adding things like dextrose or table sugar or like circose to your batch, just be careful with how much sugar you add because yes, you might want to squeeze a bit more booze out of it, but if you're adding too much unrefined sugars, uh, it's going to really stress that yeast out. So don't sacrifice booze at the cost of flavor. So just take it easy on adding things like circose, dextrose, all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, last, obviously, uh, don't ferment too hot. Next up, diacetyl. So this one is something we have mentioned here and there in various uh, brew day videos. And we talk about diacetyl rests towards the end of fermentation. Basically, diacetyl is a compound that's made from diacetyl precursors during the, uh, the beginning stage of the fermentation process. So diacetyl will always be present in a beer. There's no way to not make it. It's about how well do you actually clean it up. So to give you a bit of context, it's that taste and flavor that's kind of like butter, butterscotch, and honestly, the best way I can describe it is like, if you stick your nose into a bag of microwave popcorn, like really buttery microwave popcorn, it's got that smell, it's got that kind of flavor. You don't really want butter in a beer. It doesn't go together. So there's a couple reasons why this doesn't get cleaned up if you don't brew properly. So firstly, if you stress your yeast out. So if during the start of fermentation, there's not enough oxygen, it's gonna to lead to way more diacetyl precursors being in that batch, being created in that batch, which throughout the fermentation process is gonna produce much more diacetyl. Second way is if you are doing, especially something like a lager, they're, they're notorious for diacetyl problems. Towards the end of fermentation, you need to do a diacetyl rest. So that basically means over the course of two to three days, bump up the temperature of your fermentation by a couple of degrees. So maybe like one to two degrees Celsius for two to three days. The reason you do that is because diacetyl gets absorbed by yeast back into their cell walls. When you bump up that temperature right at the end and you encourage your yeast to munch up those last few remaining sugars, it kind of gets them back into circulation, back into flocculation inside your wort, and it's gonna help the yeast absorb all those diacetyl compounds floating around. If you don't encourage that process at the end of fermentation basically it doesn't give the yeast the chance to clean up that mess and absorb all that diacetyl back into their cell walls the last thing you can do to help uh, prevent this from happening or the last thing you can do which causes this to happen is if you rack bottle can whatever you want to call it if you package your beer too early if you do a fermentation even if it's finished fermenting in like three days if you've got some crazy fast fermenting yeast give it a few more days to clean itself up. Those off flavors do help uh, to get a bit cleaned up by the yeast being in suspension. So if you rack your beer off your yeast cake too early, you don't give the yeast the chance to munch up that remaining diacetyl and remove it from your final product. So be patient, let the yeast do its job. Don't try to rush fermentation too fast. Number four, astringency. So this one is kind of like bitterness, but not really. So it's got that bitterness feeling, but it's more like that mouth puckering, like that, like drying out your mouth sort of thing. Kind of, it's kind of powdery, but it's wet. It's like, it, it's a weird one. The best way that I can describe this and don't take this to a dirty place is tea bagging. So if you suck on like a tea bag, like when you make like a cup of like English breakfast or whatever, if you sucked on the tea bag and it's got that weird dry, bitter, like yeah, kind of flavor going on, that's astringency. There's a couple reasons that this happens in a beer and no, it's not because of tea bagging. So what happens is basically the poly polyphenols, which are tannins essentially, uh, coat your tongue and then that reacts with the proteins inside your mouth and that causes this weird coating powdery feeling of your tongue, which is the astringency effect taking place. There's a couple reasons why this one happens. It's all about tannins. So this one goes more back to the grain side of things. So uh, grains and hops. So when you're actually doing your mash day, if you are someone that does sparging when you do your mashing, if you over sparge your grains, you're gonna start leaching tannins back into your wort. So as a general rule of thumb, you don't really wanna go lower than a gravity of 1.01 coming off your sparge water definitely not lower than 1.005 anything beyond that you're not we're going to be pulling remaining sugars anymore you're just going to be stripping off those tannins from the grains and leaching that into your product 
Once it's in there, you can't fix it. It's done. There's no way to clean this one up. The second big way that this one happens is from over dry hopping or from using hops that have a really low alpha acid content. So if you're using a lot of hops in your boiling stage, and but you use heaps of hops towards the end of boil, for example, that have really low alpha acid content, it's really gonna encourage astringency to come through from the vegetal matter inside, that, inside those hops. Same thing for dry hopping. If you over dry hop and you let those hops have too much contact time with your beer, it's gonna start creating astringency. That vegetal content, that vegetal, you know, weird blech, flavor, it's gonna leach into your product. And then you can kind of clean that one up with a bit of time, letting it settle in the keg for a little while, hoping that it kind of cleans itself up over a couple of weeks, but it's one that you'd rather avoid. So yes, we do love hops. We are massive hop lovers, but you can't over hop your beers and you can't let your beer have too much contact time with those hops. So best ways to correct this one is make sure that when you're mashing, don't go too high on the pH scale. That's going to leach astringency. Don't over sparge. That's going to bring astringency and don't um, mash too hot. Again, also going to introduce more chance of astringency. As far as the hopping side of things goes, try to use higher alpha acids for really big hop amounts and try to reduce contact time with the dry hops with your uh, fermenting beer. So do a trub dump. If you can't do a trub dump, use a hop bag so you can remove the hops and make sure that it only has say a couple days contact time. It's not sitting there for a week ruining that batch of beer. Number five. I forgot. <laughs> Let's do it again. Number five esters so this one again is a bit of a strange one because there are a lot of beers where we do want to encourage esterification uh particularly in things like neepers belgians trappist styles those really high alcohol dense kind of uh, european beers where you're really relying on the yeast to provide the flavor you want esterification but there's a lot of beers where you really don't want that things like a really clean uh you know american pale ale or a really clean crisp lager there's those styles where esters are not really providing any value, it's just detracting from the beer. Typically, esters are providing things that are really fruity, so especially uh, when it's bad esterification, it's extensive amounts of like banana-y kind of flavors, cloves, those sort of really fruity, but not necessarily in a great way sort of thing. That's when you know that esters are playing a bad role in a beer, especially if it's a beer that you don't want those esters to be there. So this one is a little bit complicated. Basically, esters are formed from acetyl-CoA, which is a compound that gets used by the yeast to create cellular building blocks. It uses uh, those cellular, it creates things like sterols, fatty acids, etc., from a bunch of nutrients that are available utilizing that acetyl-CoA. Here's the thing though, this is all during that exponential phase where your yeast is just multiplying again and again and again and again. So when that yeast has finished the logarithmic phase and it no longer needs to multiply so rapidly, it stops using that acetyl-CoA. That extra stuff sitting in the beer ends up turning into esters and then that's gonna produce that whole host of esterification that you might not necessarily want. So scientific side of things aside, what can we actually do about this? There's a couple of things. It's mostly about making yeast basically being as comfortable as possible. So simple things like Pitching the right amount of yeast, not under pitching. When you under pitch, stresses yeast out, it's gonna help push it towards esterification. Pitch the right amount of yeast. Keep that yeast at a happy temperature. Don't make it too hot, don't make it too cold. A kind of a unique solution to this is actually allowing some of your trub from your uh, brew day to go into your fermenter. Because as I mentioned, it's using acetyl-CoA to break down nutrients to create cellular building blocks. So if you actually allow some of that trub in, it can help because trub is really high in um, you know, fatty acids and sterols. So the acetyl-CoA is not needed as much because a lot of those building blocks are already being provided to the yeast. So if you allow that clumpy, murky stuff at the bottom of your boiler, just a bit more than usual to go into your fermenter, you're basically giving your yeast a helping hand and it doesn't need to do so much work on its own. Last thing that you can do with all of this is pressure. So we're talking about, um, uh, what is it, uh, hydrostatic pressure. So in large commercial breweries where they have really, really tall tanks, there's hydrostatic pressure being formed just by the sheer amount of liquid. That pressure prevents um, so much of this acetyl-CoA from producing so much esters. We don't have that luxury in the home brewer world, but what we can do is pressure fermentation. So 
if your uh, fermentation vessel has the capability to do so, do a pressure fermentation. Keep it around 10 PSI, and that's going to really help to make a much cleaner beer. So I can put some links down below if you want to see how you can do pressure fermentation. There's a couple of like kind of cheap equipment pieces you can use. We'll drop it down below for you. But basically, the moral of the story here is make your yeast happy, keep it in the right conditions, give it plenty of nutrients, and you're going to have a much cleaner product. Quick addition to that also, uh, ferment on the colder side of things. So it's kind of a given, but it's worth pointing out. When you start to ferment warmer, you start pushing the yeast towards the higher stress side of things, and it starts producing more fruity flavors. That's great if you want that yeasty, fruity flavor in a beer, but if you want it to be cleaner, ferment on the lower side of the recommendations for that yeast from wherever you're buying your yeast from. So ferment a little bit cooler, it'll make a cleaner beer. Number six, medicinal. We are not doctors here, we are brewers. Why are we making medicinal products? Basically, uh, when I say medicinal, it's kind of flavors like, the best way that I can explain it, it tastes like Band-Aids. Uh, if you're not from Australia, uh, plastic strips. You know when you like get a cut and you put that little plastic thing on it to stop it from bleeding? That thing, that kind of weird plastic taste that you get in those kind of products, that's what it smells like and that's what you kind of imagine it tastes like. I've never licked a Band-Aid, but that's what it smells, it tastes like. That's what it tastes like, it smells like. Whatever, you get the, guy, the general idea. It can also be described as like, you know, spicy clothes and hot plastic. Like if you leave like a plastic tub out on a hot summer's day and then you smell the plastic, it's that kind of thing going on in your beer. And that is definitely going on in this one here. So let's talk about how to prevent it. Basically, there's two main ways that this one gets caused. One is from basically just being too much chlorine inside your beer. So if you're using a chlorinated or a, uh, an iodine uh, solution based cleaning product, really, really, you have to make sure that you wash the crap out of that thing before any beer goes into that fermenter. So if you haven't gotten all of that cleaning product off the fermenter and there's too much chlorine left there, too much iodine left there, there's just nothing you can do to fix it. It's just raw in that batch. So just make sure that you've been quite thorough with getting all those types of cleaning solutions out if you're using that type of cleaning solution. Second way that this gets caused is by wild bacteria and wild yeast. And that's the way that I think has happened with this one. So I'm gonna walk you through the process here. When you use your yeast too many times for too many generations, you start getting all kinds of off flavors. One of the reasons you get those off flavors is because every time that yeast is used and it's active and it's in an open environment or you transfer or whatever, you're giving it the opportunity to get infected by wild bacteria, fungi, and other wild yeasts. I suspect that's what's happened here because this one, this particular Nipah was brewed with something like a generation eight or 10 or something yeast. So that means I'd use it in like 10 different batches. By that point, from using it in fermentation, capturing some, cleaning it, using it again, so on and so forth, I think it's gotten infected and that bacteria has started to produce that weird plastic band-aid off flavor. So the best way to prevent this one, don't use your yeast for too many generations. It starts changing, you start introducing other wild products and you're not actually using the clean single strain that you started with when you bought it from your yeast supplier, like your White Labs or your Safael or whatever. So. You know, just change over your yeast every now and then. It's the same thing that commercial breweries do. They typically don't use a yeast generation for more than 10 times because you start getting this weird, funky stuff going on. So get rid of your yeast. Don't be cheap. Start fresh and, uh, you know, keep on kicking on. There you have it, guys. Those are the six most common off flavors found in the world of home brewing. So I hope that this was useful to you. I hope that you can kind of use this video to self-diagnose why some of your batches might have turned out not quite the way you wanted. Um, honestly, I learned a bit uh, doing the research for this video as well. So it's definitely given me some pointers on things to look for to make sure that my beers turn out the way that I want them to turn out in future. So I hope it does the same for you. In any case, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'm not drinking that because I am done with that batch. I'm gonna go dump it on the grass now and kill some weeds. But uh, in any case, guys, like and subscribe. See you next time. And as always, keep on brewing.